Welcome. So the descriptor in the book that you have is a pretty accurate one because it generates lots of questions. I think good sessions are based on folks being challenged a tiny bit. So I'll, I'll take them a little further than perhaps uh, we were all expecting to go. But I actually want to hear from you by the time we're done. So once we've carpet bombed all the different ideas around technology and <laughs> agrofoods, we'd love to hear from you, knowledgeable individuals in the audience, about topics we haven't touched on yet. But I was intrigued at the selection process here because different parts of the change that we're going to see in how food is delivered are represented on this panel. And I'm going to ask each of the panelists to tell us a bit about the role they see their companies playing in this process. It's sort of like touching the elephant. There's a lot of different places we could touch, and you'll have touched them all by the time we're done today. So Matt, from Plenty, if you could speak a tiny bit uh, about what you're up to and, and how the indoor world is changing. Well, at Plenty, what we're doing is we're working on bringing the farm inside uh, for a whole series of crops. Uh, if you look at the choices that have been available to humanity over the last 10,000 years of you know, the organized cultivation of plants, uh, you know, what we're doing is to, is to bring control where we uh, have not had control. Uh, and what that means is we get to do things like uh, uh, reassert and reestablish the, the connection between flavor and nutrition. So uh, we call that moving, moving it from should to want. Uh, because everyone knows we should eat our vegetables, uh, but there's a reason why people say uh, you have to. Uh, so we're, we're, we're working to move that from should to want and creating uh, you know, flavor profiles in plants that just aren't possible uh, when you have to grow them in the field in an uncontrollable environment and then put them on trucks for 3,000 miles in a couple weeks. Uh, so uh, we're pretty excited about the, uh, the opportunity in front of us to help uh, you know, people live happier, healthier, longer lives, uh, in part by making uh, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables uh, you know, so much healthier for, uh, and so much uh, tastier to compete with all of the highly processed sugars, flours, uh, and fats of the world. How many places do you have right now where you're actually growing produce? Uh, well, we, have, uh, we just opened our third in Seattle about a week ago. And, uh, and we have, uh, we have a, a lot more uh, in the works. So. Nick, sweet green, chain, uh, different types of challenges. You're trying to get consumers to pay attention to what you're up to. How are you disrupting the agro space? So ultimately for us over 10 years, which is when we started 10 years ago, it's been incredible to watch how much technology has changed our business from how we source food to how we distribute it. But ultimately I would say the thing that has really have made the biggest impact is the way that our customers transact with food. And even in the past five years, seeing this kind of digital revolution that's happened to so many industries happen in food um, has been fascinating. You know, today, almost half of our transactions happen on our app. Mm. And as we look at Sweetgreen, what we've been trying to do over 10 years is really connect people to real food and make healthy food more accessible and craveable. Um, and ultimately, that's what drove so much of processed fast food for decades, was it was the easiest, it was the best tasting, um, and it was marketed the best. And so for us, it's about tr taking those same ideas and elevating healthy food in that same way. So making it more accessible, and our app makes it that much easier to order your food and the restaurants or pickup points. But as you start to think about different channels like delivery and just creating a closer connection for customers with healthy food. Uh, James uh, is at, at Peel. I, I met him actually at Tony Prisker's cocktail party, trying to get in front of him in line. He's a pretty imposing figure. <laughs> I couldn't get there, but while we're waiting, I learned a lot about it. Fascinating approach. Uh, again, you're sort of a creator of new types of food. Uh, th that's actually an interesting way to, uh, to frame that. You know, when we think about what we're doing is uh, we're truly totally trying to look at, um, for the last 10,000 years in organized agriculture, as we might call it, um, we have made assumptions about the intrinsic properties of a piece of, of fresh produce. And that key intrinsic property is the perishability of that produce. The fact that uh, fresh produce is seasonal as well as perishable. So again, you're in season and you have an oversupply of fresh produce, or you're out of, se out of season and the perishability limits how long you have that produce available. And so uh, because of this kind of intrinsic property, we've developed supply chains uh, which have been set up to accommodate this characteristic. And so what we're doing at Appeal is uh, asking the question, um, is that perishability intrinsic to the produce itself or is it just a manifestation um, of uh, the evolutionary pressures that have been placed on that piece of produce? Um, and so what we do at Appeal is uh, we take plant material and cre we create formulations that are in the format of a powder 
Um, it's lightweight, it's uh, low cost for us to distribute. We ship it to where we'd like to use it, and then we mix it back up with the water. We do that, we then dip fresh produce into that solution and we allow it to dry. And when it dries, the molecules that we choose self-assemble into this imperceptibly thin barrier around the outside of the produce. And by precisely controlling the composition of that barrier, we're able to independently modulate the rate that water and CO2 escape from the produce relative to the rate that oxygen gets in. And by doing that, as the fruit continues to breathe and respire as it moves throughout the supply chain, we're able to build up these optimized little microclimates inside each individual piece of produce, which then allow you to take the benefits that you would get during transportation storage and translate them to when they're sitting on a, a produce shelf uh, at, at a retail store and then ultimately uh, home uh, when, when you're at home as the consumer. And when you start to unlock or reduce the perishability of fresh produce, a lot of really exciting things can happen. Why did you even think of doing this? <laughs> um, I'll, I'll spare you all of the details, but uh, my uh, undergraduate uh, degree in Pittsburgh, uh, I went to Carnegie Mellon, I was a metallurgist there. And as a metallurgist at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh, you study steel. And um, people don't really think about it, but steel is perishable. It's a longer time frame, um, but it is perishable in that it reacts with oxygen in the atmosphere. And when that happens, you form iron oxide, which are the rust particles which will eat through that chunk of steel. Um, Intel metallurgists uh, figured out this really clever trick, which was to incorporate small numbers of sacrificial atoms, um, elements like molybdenum, chromium, nickel, um, these elements. And when you did that, if you selected them appropriately, those elements would preferentially diffuse to the surface of that chunk of steel. And when they did that, they would react with oxygen in the atmosphere. And when they did that, you would form this little oxide barrier around the outside of that chunk of steel, which would physically passivate further oxygen from reaching that surface. And so when we learned about this issue that people were going hungry because of the perishability of fresh produce, and the perishability of fresh produce is being caused by water loss and oxidation, and steel was perishable, and it was perishable because of the diffusion of oxygen, we asked ourselves the question, well, if a diffusion barrier could solve that problem for steel, could a diffusion barrier solve that problem for fresh produce? And could we build that barrier out of food itself? And um, that was the, the birth of appeal. I probably bring it up because it's interesting that the steel industry will come up with solutions before the food industry did. <laughs> you would think it would be the inverse, uh, but it actually is a lesson because I think many of the companies represented here are looking at, uh, at businesses that are, have been cr analogies of which have been created in other sectors. So the brand is an interesting business, Tina. Be be as you tell us about what you do, please explain to me why three dollars. Is that mm. something as a, as a small child you thought was a sort of a cool number? Um, so, well, there's. I can answer that question now, or uh, as much as I like. Vertical farming is incredible, and uh, sweet greens is changing the way we think about fast food. And appeal is saving the world's vegetables. Um, at Brandless, I thought maybe we'd bring a video um, and let that story uh, tell itself. So maybe we can watch that, and then I'll answer your question. Perfect. A commercial break. Commercial break. <laughs> Dear Brandless. Greetings from Vermont. Utah. We're Tennessee. not seeing the video. We're hearing we got it. our first yeah. Brandless order today. I'm really into this concept. Better living for less. A freaking amazing. My new go-to place for certified organic pantry items. Clean beauty supplies. The best snacks. Non-toxic cleaning supplies. High five to Brand Liz for mastering the art of gluten-free mac and cheese. So many vegan options. Thanks, Brand Liz. And only three dollars? I'm sold. Three dollars. Who says better has to cost more? That's why we eliminate the middlemen that make national brands more expensive. And focused on making hundreds of awesome products at a fair price. Shipped right to your door. Better everything for everyone. All for three dollars. Start building your brandless box today and get free shipping on your first order. So that's, we launched nine months ago. Um, that's kind of how the country is feeling about brandless. And um, to answer your question, it would be who says better needs to cost more? It really doesn't. And one of the challenges we have with food and access to great food and understanding great food is democratizing that access. And so we can make the most incredible things, but if people can't afford it, 
Um, if people don't feel like they've been invited to that party, then what are we really doing? Um, so at Brandless, by eliminating all of the middlemen, as many have done in direct consumer businesses before, that's not a novel idea, but nobody's done it in CPG. And we didn't just do it for any kind of food. It's all non-GMO, mostly organic. Our cleaning is Safer Choice certified. Our beauty is clean, uh, rid of the 400 ingredients you don't want in those products. Even our toilet paper is not. We don't cut down trees. We use bamboo grasses and sugar cane. And so access to those kinds of things, one, it's hard to find them. Two, um, they're not, most people are not invited to that party from a price perspective. And three, in spite of, you know, LA, San Francisco, New York, like the cities where we could spin in a circle and find 10 stores that might be able to have those things, the middle of the country cannot find that, and that does not mean they do not want them. Um, so people shouldn't have to choose between what they want for themselves and their families and what they can afford. That's why $3. Is bamboo soft enough to clean yourself with? <laughs> I will uh, give you a sample, but it's made with bamboo and sugar cane, so. So sweet. You know, you'll have to figure that out for yourself. So, so you, you, you asked a provocative question, you know, who says it needs to be more expensive? But if I go to a, a store like Trader Joe's, Whole Foods, the products that are perceived as healthier from my perspective as a physician generally are more expensive, even in stores that do seem to be cutting out like, the, like Trader Joe's the middleman. So is there an inherent price difference, I would think, between an organic product or not organic, or is that so tiny, it doesn't really affect the, the final price? It's imperceptible, and if you talk to retailers um, and buyers who develop these things, they'll tell you that when doing the pricing system, they say, oh, that's organic, that's better, well, let's charge 30% more for that, because we know they'll pay for it. Okay. And everybody's trying to claw back margin, and so better doesn't need to cost more. Um, and if you actually, the reason why we picked $3 and why we created this extraordinary line of things was because we also think there's this paradox of choice and that we're so overwhelmed with messages and prices and packaging and information and there's just so much choice that there's something very relaxing about not having to bother checking prices, um, that it's all $3 and it's all better. Well, I went to your website, but you can, you can buy three things for $3 too. Well, on the organic beans, it's three for three dollars, um, and on uh, gluten-free and organic mac and cheese, those are two for three dollars. Um, but it's just one simplified system um, that we think just makes it easier and stops the screaming and the shouting. At the end of the day, like the Price is Right is still on the air 30 years later because people don't really know prices. And if you talk to them in the aisle, and then you talk to them at the register, and you ask them what they just bought, they couldn't tell you the price. So it's I was. Yeah, All I'm, a manipulation, in my opinion. I, I was at the Vatican with some of you uh, f until yesterday, and I rushed back, and guess who won the Emmy for, 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 for game shows? The Price is Right. <laughs> so it's still a very popular show, it turns out. Uh, Matt, how does a, a small company that's, that's getting its act together deal with the big chains that ultimately will be responsible for getting the word out about you? The big food that will either buy you or devour you, and not in a good way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and they, they, uh, they don't like other brands between them and their customer. Uh, that said, uh, there's, there are a lot of good grocers in the world. And uh, y you know what, what we're doing is, w as we've worked to reestablish the connection between flavor and nutrition, uh, we are growing uh, produce that is just more delicious than what's on the shelf. And so uh, the reason that they are coming to us, not only here in the United States, but around the world, is because, uh, first of all, uh, we have run out of land in the places in this world where it is economic to grow these crops. Uh, there are only five Mediterranean climates in the world. That's where most of these crops are grown. Uh, and it's where they're grown most economically. And so one way to think about what we're doing is uh, we are uh, we're making farms, you know, with computer vision and, and automation and, uh, and, you know, years of established plant science to ship California, uh, 360, you know, California the last week of June everywhere all over the world. Uh, and so that's something that um, uh, that's quite a compelling offering because of the tastes and, and the nutrition that they can provide to their customers. So it's the thing that brings people into the store. Uh, fresh produce drives about six times more traffic in grocery than the next highest traffic driver other than dairy, and it blows dairy away by about 3x. So they, they have to provide their customers a great experience there, and people want nutrient-rich foods. It's just that they're not very available. It's one of the few markets in the world where uh, uh, demand is a function of supply rather than supply being a function of demand. Uh, so we're working to flip that on its end and, uh, and change that equation so that instead of 
for every one unit of demand being met, for every four being unmet, we, 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 we flip that around. And what, what, the five-minute training zones are California? Uh, the Mediterranean uh, climates are California, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Chile, uh, South Africa, and the actual Mediterranean. So six. Yeah, yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah. I never thought of it in that context. So Canada gets all of its produce primarily? Uh, pr pretty much, uh, either from California uh, or, uh, or elsewhere in the world. And Nick, sweet greens, I would think, would be a candidate to be either taken over by a large food corp or you'd have to get big pretty quickly to be able to compete. How, how do you play that game when there are lots of imbalances already built into the system? You know, for us and our business scale is pretty challenging because restaurants are pretty capital intensive. And for us, that's why the, we've invested most in our connection with the customer. So like I said before, 50% of our transactions are directly on our app with our customers. That means for the first time in our space at scale, we have this direct connection with our customer. Um, so often for decades and years, the restaurant or the food provider didn't know who their customer was. It was an anonymous transaction. Mm -hmm. um, and today, I mean, Starbucks and Domino's are probably the two that have the most, but um, at the end of this year, we'll have a million active users on our app. So for us to have that direct connection with the customer, at the rate that the customer is changing, it is so powerful. It allows us to understand what they want, what they want to feel when they come into Sweet Green, what they want out of their food experience, um, and ultimately where they're going and where the behavior is going. So at the end of the day, whether it's, you know, we continue to grow on our own or there is, you know, there are a lot of other options for brands like us, but what's most valuable for us is that direct connection with the customer. So Tina says that the pricing of better for you foods is, I don't forget the, the, the adjective you use, but let's just say trivially different, not meaningful mm -hmm. in, in, in terms of what the true final price is. Has that been your experience as well? I think when you're talking within the world of food that is processed versus real food, it's a little different. For us, the real cost of our food comes from sourcing it the right way seasonally um, and regionally. And then once that produce comes into our restaurants, everything is made from scratch every single day in every restaurant. And there's reasons for nutrition, for flavor, to connect both our customers and our team members to the food. But for us, it's really about building a different type of restaurant economic model. You know, for us, we don't serve soda, for example. Mm -hmm. If we're not the biggest, we're one of the biggest chains in the country that doesn't serve soda. And historically, so much of a fast food or fast casuals model, economic model, depends on the profits from soda. So it's, it's been this, this journey to just rethink the whole model from how the food is sourced at scale uh, to how it's produced to how we interact with our customer and tell stories around the food. And just so I'm clear on this, so if 50%, 1 million uh, customers' transactions is only on the app, they're just doing pickup? They're doing either payment or pickup, yes. So that doesn't even include delivery today. But what, what, if you pay, aren't you picking it up? So with our app, actually customers can come in, order in the restaurant, and then pay with their app. So awesome. it's a payment, ordering, and eventually delivery app. Got it. Uh, James, y people have to want to buy what you're making. So large dis distributors of food are going to come in and say, I like this, it sounds good, or my customers are going to reject this, it seems synthetic, I don't want them buying something that came out of the steel industry. H how do you play in a pretty big swimming pool when you're still a relatively small fish? Yeah, um, well, it's something that, you know, we are trying to be very, very transparent and forthcoming with information around how we're solving this problem. At the end of the day, as a company, our philosophy is that we're not going into a laboratory and making up new molecules that nature's never seen before. We're looking to nature to see how it's solving this problem and then cutting and copying that exactly back into the food system. When plants evolved out of water and onto land, the evolutionary adaptation which allowed them to do that was the formation of this thin polymeric barrier around the outside of the produce called cutin. And that evolutionary adaptation allowed them to physically resist the desiccative stress from the atmospheric environment. And this evolutionary adaptation has been so important that it's been conserved between species, meaning every single surface of a plant which grows above the surface of the earth is covered with this thin protective barrier. And so we ask the question, okay, well if the chemical composition of the surface of a strawberry is identical to that of a lemon, what is it about the lemon which allows it to last for a month where the strawberry can only last for a day? And it all comes down to how those molecules are arranged on the surface. So it's not the specific molecules themselves. 
It's the arrangement of those molecules. And this is what nature does again and again and again. It uses the same exact materials. It just puts them into different arrangements, and those arrangements transmit new value into the world. And so what we do at Appeal is we identify those molecules in nature, we find out how to isolate them, and then by precisely controlling the, the ratios of these components, we're able to create these formulas such that when we spray them or dip them onto the surface of fresh produce, those molecules, the same molecules that the plants have <coughs> been using to defend themselves for millions of years, assemble into structures um, which give the, the appearance of a strawberry, you know, resembling the shelf life of a lemon more closely um, than, than that of a strawberry. So um, it's... Uh, at the end of the day for us around uh, you know, using, like working with nature and not apart from nature. Because when we work apart from nature, that's when we get ourselves into trouble. When we come up with these um, solutions or these new chemistries that we've made up that may solve one problem, they end up creating a bunch of other problems. And so what we've done as a company is say, philosophically, our mission is again, not to create new chemistries, not to go into a laboratory and make new molecules, but let's find those molecules which nature is already using to solve these problems, and then let's use them to solve today's challenges. So how, how much of a difference change. does it make? How long would a strawberry last normally, and what does it last until the traditional time when we throw it away? Yeah, it, so it, it depends on the number of factors. Um, so we normally talk about things in relative terms. So. The formulations which we have available commercially today uh, achieve an average extension of a doubling of the shelf life of that produce. Um, in our laboratories, we have the ability to get a tripling of the shelf life of fresh produce. And the, the North Star for us is a, is a quadrupling of the shelf life of fresh produce because when you can hit that mark, you can effectively replace cold chain infrastructure with the use of this technology, and, and that can be completely transformative in places of the world that don't have the type of cold chain infrastructure that we're so fortunate to have here today. Am, am I correct in assuming that about a third of all produce is thrown away because of spoilage? A estimates range between a third and a half of what we're growing is ending up in the land. So if you were to double the shelf life, what impact does that have on the percentage of food we throw away? Um, massive. Massive impact. If you ask a, a you know, if you ask a person today, where do you see abundance? Um, the answer they'll, they'll tell you will be, you see it in the grocery store. And not in your home. And, and the reason for that is that we have developed technologies which do an excellent job maintaining produce quality during transportation uh, and, and storage. Uh, effectively, we put produce in these cold, wet boxes. You see them in trucks, you see them in the shipping containers. If you dial down the temperature and you dial up the relative humidity in one of those boxes, you can slow down the rate the clock is ticking inside of that produce by about a factor of four or five. The problem is, is those optimal storage conditions are directly at odds with the optimal merchandising conditions for the produce, which are you know, the, the adage in the industry is stack it high and watch it fly. It's large <laughs> displays, walk into the grocery store, you're, you're hit right away with the huge displays of, of fresh produce, and they're in a comfortable, well-lit, ambient environment where you're supposed to see and interact with and, and select your, your ingredients. And so by creating this technology, which creates this microclimate inside each individual piece of produce, we're bringing the shelf life benefit not only during transportation storage, but it carries over during the merchandising period and then ultimately home to the consumer. And the end result or the desire of, of what we're creating at Appeal is to bring abundance into the home so that you won't need to jump out of your chair and go say, I need to go buy more bananas, but rather you'll have enough bananas in your home to go pick up a banana when you want one. Stack it high, watch it fly. <laughs> that's, that's the old so, adage. So, Tina, is that what they do in stores? Like, like well, actually, you know, it goes back to that paradox of choice, which is yes, they do. And the challenge at stores and where consumers are getting really um, frustrated is that the national brands are trying to hold on to the shelf space they have um, because the house brands, the private label brands, which are made by the stores, so by their customers essentially, are sitting right along the shelf. Um, and they're saying, okay, well, you know, here's your national brand, ours is 20% off. And so there's this battle going on at the shelf, which has actually nothing to do with the consumer. Um, it's the store fighting their supplier and the supplier trying to hold on desperately to the store because they don't have any other means of distribution. Meantime, the consumer left the building. 
And so they're battling it out, and the consumer's like, uh, this is not about me, I'll let you guys work this out, but we're gonna figure out something else. And especially in the everyday essentials and consumables category, it's a laggard category in e-commerce. So Amazon, Walmart, everybody um, is actually trying to go after that category to actually go direct to the home and bypass um, the chain. Brandless is starting with everyday essentials. We're not in fresh and we won't be in fresh. Um, that's a much more complicated business that these guys are nailing, uh, but we're doing not only um, consumables, but we're also doing beauty and cleaning and housewares. And the big innovation from a technology perspective outside of the type of uh, extraordinary things that Sweetgreen is doing, and we are as well in our direct consumer relationships, is really in innovating at the supply chain level. Right now, everything in the world is built to go to the shelf, we want to build to ship. So we don't think you need to ship air, you don't need to ship um, water. Um, so we're trying to innovate at the supply chain level to say how can we take the water out of a broth, as an example, and ship uh, an organic uh, concentrate because that's really what all you're buying at the store is the organic concentrate and the water. Um, but why should we be shipping water? That doesn't make any sense. That costs more money, it's carbon footprint, um, it's size of box, and it's shipping, it's inefficient. But the entire world is building products for the shelf, and people are not able to actually build it to ship, and that's what we're starting to do with our supply chain. You mentioned that it's a laggard. Is that because it's got air or water added to it, so it becomes inefficient to ship? Well, I'd say no, not the, yes to that, but I think the consumables, people are used to their routines of having to go into the supermarket, you know, once a week or twice a week, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the whole grocery and consumables category is a laggard in e-commerce. Um, and so it's a category that's coming. I mean, it's not unusual to think about buying lots of different things online, but shifting to buying your everyday essentials online, that's a new category for the mass consumer market. Let me ask all of you, for your vision for, for what this space looks like in five years. Matt, we'll start with you, just because mm -hmm. you're sort of a nascent space, but what could it be? Well, you know, part of it uh, piles on to what, uh, what James and, and Tina are talking about here, which is uh, if you think about what perishability does to, to, to how people consume uh, food, um, there was a study done where they took cohorts of folks on food stamps and they told them, hey, if, you, uh, if this is no good in your fridge one week later, uh, we guarantee it will be. If it's not, bring it back. We will replace it, no questions asked. And the consumption of fruits and vegetables amongst those food stamp cohorts skyrocketed. Mm. Uh, and that's because they removed the perishability constraint. And so we had plenty in pushing uh, you know, the last week of June in California all over the world intend to do similar things. So we, we've been getting anywhere from one to six weeks of additional shelf life from our product tests. And so we generally target at least two weeks of additional shelf life. That effectively removes the perishability constraint from many of these crops. Uh, so that now not only have we reestablished that connection between flavor and nutrition uh, with this delicious produce, but it's not, they, they're not throwing away 40%, you were asking before, 40% of what people buy at the shelf, they're throwing away. So how, how do you get two weeks extra shelf life? What, what, what about what you're doing growing the plants indoors allows that? Well, first of all, we are, we're, we're, we're collapsing the supply chain. So you, you collapse that. You're, you're driving two to 4,000 miles out of the supply chain by eliminating that long haul transmission trunk. Uh, because that average strawberry you're eating uh, here in the United States is traveling uh, a good 2,400 miles. If you're on the East Coast, it's traveling 3,000 miles. It's tired and exhausted, and it was white when it started, uh, you know, when they picked it, uh, or at least it's, partially. It's white. cold and wet. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Cold and wet. <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, so, th so that's one way, is you take, you, you take a week in trucks out of the equation uh, in distribution centers. You then remove handling steps. So by putting everything in the same building, rather than it being picked, uh, shipped, unpacked, washed, packed, repalletized, put on another truck, shipped again to a distribution center where it then gets reparsed and then shipped to store. We are collapsing that to the, uh, most of that is happening in one building. So you're talking about eliminating, eliminating hours and days uh, there, and then eliminating a few days in trucks. And so you're saved at least a, a week by the time it gets to the shelf, if not more. You're then eliminating steps, which y every step reduces shelf life. Uh, and then we're eliminating specific types of steps. So we are able to apply 
uh, federal and global food safety standards at the growing stage in a way that is impossible out in the field and in a greenhouse where you don't uh, control insects, rodents, mammals, birds. And so because we apply those food safety standards at the growing level, we then don't have to apply bleach and saline to the produce, which further drives down shelf life. So all of the, you add all those things, you pile on, and you end up with two weeks of additional shelf life, and in some cases, you know, three to six. Nick, five years from now, I'm sure your industry will have dramatically shifted. So you've got all these sweet greens all over the country by then. What's going to fundamentally change in how people use your, your stores? Right, so I think... For us, we've seen in the past couple of years this incredible push towards just ultimate transparency and traceability. People want to know so much more about their food, how it was grown, how it affects them. And that pressure, you know, they're putting that pressure on food companies. And then there's this whole next generation of food companies like us up here that are creating that reality. So I think there's going to be a continued push towards transparency, and not just in how things are grown and how it's getting to people uh, and what's actually in these ingredients. I think ultimately the next step, and we talk a lot about this today at Sweetgreen, is this idea of just more personalized nutrition and people actually understanding their own personal health and what they should be eating. And I think there's so many misconceptions and noise out there about what is healthy and what people should be eating. And the reality is it's different for everyone. And you know we haven't quite gotten there yet, and there's a bunch of incredible technology out there that are, that's starting to create those connections. So for us at Sweetgreen, it's, you know, today our mission is to connect people to real food, and we get really excited when we start thinking about the reality and we can connect you to the food that is right for you. So opening your Sweetgreen app and having it be fully customizable and personalized based on your behavior, based on your preferences, eventually based on your microbiome, your gut health, your DNA, all those things, really understanding what each person should be eating um, and really creating that true connection to real food. That, that's part of what you're going to actually do with sweet greens. Mm -hmm. So that's not going to be outsourced to folks who are building bio measurement tools and better ways. We of will be using partners for many parts. I mean, we're not going to start measuring that ourselves, but there will be partners involved in that. So how, how does it hurt you? And this is a question for the Tyra. When people make claims that are probably not that accurate about things like the microbiome, which is the hot topic these days, and start saying, you know, th this probiotic, which probably does work for 80% of people, works for everybody. Or offer that it provides a benefit that's probably beyond what you might get just from eating healthy food? You know, there's so much confusion out there and you know, so many different companies and, and, and products are on the market that create a lot of noise, like I said, around what's good for you. And so for us, it's just been about, our message has been one of just pure transparency and trying to give the customer the information. So it's not necessarily saying this is good, this is bad, don't ever do this, you know, black and white. It's more about providing the information and that transparency so that our customers can make in, uh, decisions for themselves. And for us, it's never been about trying to be too preachy. Ultimately, customers want more, way more information about their food than they've ever wanted before. And we see that continuing. So just as a, as a thought, would you be asking customers, did they feel good after they ate a meal? Did, did it impact on how they performed? Because interestingly, much of what you're hoping to do doesn't even exist because no one asked the question after they've tried it, you know, outside of a laboratory setting. Is that part of your future vision? Definitely. I think looking at that full feedback loop and understanding, you know, like I said before, this connection we have to the customer creates the platform to do that, enables this interaction to know what our customers want, what they're feeling. And even today, so many of the decisions we make on our menu are based on our customers' behavior. And you see this today in so many other fields, whether it's, you know, how Netflix and, Netflix and Amazon interact with their customer and use that data to just continue to evolve and create a more optimal experience for the customer, and that's what we're trying to do in food. Tina, five years from now, what does your business look like? Is it 275 a product, <laughs> three and a quarter? No, I know. I would say that in five years, uh, a few things. Let's start all the way back at the supply chain. As I started to say earlier, right now, I mean, we just launched a company nine months ago, but we're already working with our manufacturers to kind of, you know, build for ship, not shelf. And if we can build for ship and not shelf, that would be just massive disruption, not only with the creation of products, but also for the distribution centers, looking at national distribution centers, regional distribution centers, and micro distribution centers that will also be able to superset a region to create communities. They've never really had a community. Um, my whole experience in my career has been building communities of scale. And so what we're doing at Brandless is actually listening to our community and connecting them 
And much like LinkedIn has a vertical community and it can live in a world of Facebook, which is more of a platform community. Um, and when I used to run Baby Center, that was a vertical community of moms, even in a world of Facebook and LinkedIn. At Brandless, I would say in five years and way before that, um, the community of gluten-free chefs, of vegan tips, of life hackers, of people who share the same passion in music or who may want to share orders in their neighborhood and deliver it to each other and like recreate those micro communities, that's going to be a huge part of our platform and the way in which we are engaging with people by highlighting them and, cr and coming back to the idea that even though we are a digitally enabled company, we are actually facilitating real world community every day. Um, the sec so that's the second. So supply chain innovation, number one. Number two is reimagining community using all of the best practices of community that we've seen in other areas and applying it to modern consumption. And I would say the third thing is that all of our everyday essentials will still be $3, but Brandless is not anti-brand, we're not generic, and we're not not a brand. We are unapologetically a brand. We're redefining what it means to be one based on truth, on trust and transparency because the top 100 CPG brands in the US last year, one out of 100, 90 were in decline, which means brands are broken and people don't trust them. And 78% of millennials don't wanna buy the products their parents use. That's like a seismic shift of a multi-trillion dollar industry. And so at Brandless, we're reimagining lots of things and starting with the things you reach for every day, but in five years, you can imagine the Brandless of X. Um, because there's so much loss of trust in institutions, there's so much loss of trust in government and other agencies and in, in what we used to know of as brands that were essentially trust marks. And if Brandless is really building a brand that's in partnership with the people we serve, the application of that will actually be defining lots of other categories where better shouldn't cost more. Do you think it's it's right that 90% of brands are in decline because people don't trust them. Is that too harsh an indictment? More of well, a reflection of the those, of That's us. the data, that's not, that's just the data. So I didn't make up the data, that's just the facts. Do I think it's an indictment? I think it's, it's whole, finally, consumers are saying enough. Like we wanna know where things come from. We wanna know 68% of Americans say they want to shop their values. Um, people want to live with purpose and meaning. 75% of, of the youth in this country want to shop from companies that are socially responsible. I mean, so I think that what we're seeing is just a major shift in consumer choice and consumers are in control because no longer is it what a, a brand says about itself, it's what a friend tells a friend. And so you can't really rely on the old ways of brands being built and distributed through the channels. CPG companies today, it's not their fault. They don't have a relationship with consumers because their customers are stores. And so the idea of being in a direct relationship with consumers is um, something that people want. And if you're going to do that, it's not an omni-channel strategy. It's actually a relationship. And so brands need to be in conversation with the people they serve. And many aren't and many are not innovating at the speed in which they need to or their products and their services are not reflecting um, modern consumption. Nestle in the US sold off their whole confection business. They're not in the chocolate business anymore in the US. Pepsi, 50% of the new businesses that they serve are taking out the sugar. I mean, there are companies that are trying to, you know, reimagine their portfolios and the way in which they engage, but you're seeing a shift in this category like you've never seen before. James, let's talk about the role of government and policy. And in agriculture, I, I remember uh, I was talking to a Senate panel, panel that Tom Harkin was leading. He was a senator from Iowa. And he was critical of farm subsidies. Does that strike any of you as awkward? He's a senator from a state that seems clearly to be linked up to farmers and soy and corn. And I asked him why, and he said, because the government gives the farmer a stack of papers like this to fill out, which they can't do, but big corporations can. So the subsidies disproportionately go to folks who probably don't need the help. The guys who it was theoretically designed for can't fill it out, and so it creates a further imbalance. In fact, we're subsidizing unhealthy behaviors, which we know is true already for many product lines. We subsidize meat, we don't subsidize fruits and vegetables. H how does that need to change for companies that can appeal to thrive? Yeah, you know, I think that uh, farmers are in a really tough spot in that, you know, Prices for fresh produce are not going up. You know, if anything, if anything, they're going down. And you know, they know what their costs are. You know, they know what their labor costs are, and they're going up too. And they know, 
you know, their input costs for water and their, their rent on the land. And they have very few avenues in which they're not a price taker in the market. And so, you know, I, I, th I think less about what, what government can do and, and more about opportunities for, you know, farmers and growers um, to create differentiation because without differentiation, you, you again, you, you end up being a, a price taker and that has negative repercussions for um, society as a whole and, and for, for, for people buying fresh produce in that there's a, a, a huge risk aversion to potentially growing a, a new crop because it may not be, uh, it may not be uh, tested in the market. And um, that, that is troubling from a biodiver when I think about it from a biodiversity standpoint. When I think about the future and, and what's possible, it, it, for me, I, I think that we're going to see an explosion in biodiversity. And the reason for that, I believe, is if you look at the number one characteristics that, that producers look at today when they develop a breeding program, the number one thing that they're breeding for is the transportability of fresh produce. And flavor, taste, nutrition, these things, I mean, might not even make the, the cutoff uh, in the breeding program. And as a result, we end up with, you know, if you walk into a grocery store today, um, there's not seven different avocados for you to choose from. There's, there's one type of avocado uh, for you to choose from. And that's because if you don't have the transportability of that crop, um, it's not a commercially viable option. Uh, you, you can't sell uh, that, that produce because you're, you don't have market access. And so when I think about the types of innovations um, that certainly government you know, may have a, a, a role in, in shaping, uh, it comes, comes down to you know, uh, you know, infrastructure improvements or supply chain innovations, which allow producers to breed for characteristics other than transportability. And so when I think about you know, the future of you know, appeal and where we, we can play a role in this is you know, if we can work with a grower who's growing something, not because um, it's what's been grown before, but because they believe in the nutrition profile, they believe in the flavor profile, it grows really, really well in lo those local growing environments, um, but maybe doesn't have the transportability, um, and we can come in and provide a technological solution which solves that transportability issue, we can drive more biodiversity into the market, and that's, that's better for everyone. That means more, more choice uh, for people. Um, the best example of this, if you walk into a grocery store, right, one avocado, there's nine kinds of apples. Why are there nine kinds of apples? Apples intrinsically have a really, really long shelf life. And as a result, we see this type of biodiversity in the store. We don't see this in other categories because uh, most produce is not so fortunate as to have this type of characteristic. So what can government do? I don't know. I'm a, I'm a scientist by training. Well, you, uh, I'll leave, well, leave that to uh, Matt on this because this comes up because Tina's saying that the U.S. population is in revolt on packaged good products because it doesn't like what it's getting. I, f I would think the U.S. population would also be revol revolting about how our money is being spent to grow certain crops versus others. Mm -hmm. So if you could get what there are folks who are policymakers in the audience, uh, what role should we all be playing in agitating to get the right kinds of incentives or to just to get out of the way? Yeah, well, uh, one is... You don't, you don't receive massive government subsidies, I gather, right? We receive none. Yeah, I didn't think <laughs> we, so. We so. receive none. <laughs> uh, so, th you know, th there's a lot of ag policy that exists today, um, both, you know, that, that prevents things, that allows for things, that provides subsidies for things. Uh, and uh, what is true is that it, uh, none of those contemplate our existence. Uh, and so in, in, a, in, a, in a day when uh, there's more unmet demand than met, uh, what we need quickly is a modernization of that policy uh, to allow for our existence. Uh, you know, we, we, uh, we, had, we worked closely with, uh, with our, the folks at the USDA and the NOSB to make sure that we could retain uh, our organic certification as the only organically certified indoor farm in the world. And, uh, and are now working with other governments around the world to make sure that they are able to modernize their policies uh, as well. So there are just things like that where, uh, you know, efforts to, um, uh, you know, to by existing constituents to label us as weird uh, are not good for humanity. You know, what we're doing is just as organic as, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and is reestablishing that connection between flavor and, and nutrition. 
And so uh, what, what we hope and uh, what we're working with policymakers around the world to do is to modernize those regulations. Uh, you know, not just because it's new doesn't mean it's weird. What, what does that mean? How, how do you, are you better off with no regulations? It's a big, let me ask the question again because it wasn't as clear. Are we, are we better off with no farm subsidies or some more even field, or do you actually need to subsidize some of these different businesses to get them up and running? That is a big question. Uh, so, so relative to uh, relative to what we do, I'll stick uh, to the first crops that we're bringing to market, which are which are fruits and vegetables, uh, and uh, we assert that uh, that no uh, subsidies are needed in order to bring us to market. Uh, now, I'll, I'll tell you, there's one exception there, which is that w our industry is a trade-off between grid power and dirty truck fuel. So uh, it's, it's roughly a, a one-for-one uh, trade-off if you look at carbon footprint. Uh, and so uh, what we're looking to do, we want to use 100% renewable energy uh, in order to produce uh, our fruits and vegetables. Uh, and so to the extent that it is uh, more expensive to produce renewable energy, uh, th you know, that, that can uh, cause difficulties in certain parts of the world or pr certain parts of the country uh, when, uh, when growing our food. So we get, you know, if, we, if we're pushed to coal production or coal energy, you know, that's, that's something we're working to avoid. So that's one area where we think that there, uh, some more effort is needed. But other than that, we're not asking for subsidies. We're asking for a modernization of regulations to allow us to be on parity with existing modes of production. Nick, who's, who's out there disrupting your space that you really are impressed by or scared by? <laughs> Um, you know, I think, like I said before, so much of how the consumer is transacting with food is changing, whether it's meal kits or grocery or, you know, virtual restaurants. And so for us, we see that disruption as a good thing because it's the evolution of where the customer is going. And for us, a company that has that connection to the customer, you know, we're excited to go there and lead the customer in that direction. You know, we look to so many of the innovations in supply chain or um, places where people are really trying to affect the way food is grown. You know, we're really, you know, excited by the stuff you guys are doing aplenty and trying to understand ultimately how we can grow food differently in this country. You know, we're a brand, and just like Tina, that we're on the consumer side trying to change demand and how people connect to food and what they know about it. But ultimately, to sell more good food, we need to grow more good food. So really trying to have an effect on um, the greater farming community and understanding that the average age of the farmer is growing and we're not protecting our soil. And so whatever we can do from a point of, uh, you know, protecting and bolstering small and medium-sized farmers, be able to grow more good food in this country, I think, is, is part of the answer. Tina, how about you? Who's in your sector that is really disrupting it nicely? You know, a company that you think is not nine months old, maybe they got there a little before you, or they're going to be coming next year? <laughs> um, you know, I think that we're seeing, you know, what we call that we eliminate, we, we sort of framed it as what we called the brand tax. Uh, it was just a way to sort of talk about all the inefficiencies in the system that caused all these markups. And there's a lot of brand tax cousins out there, um, and some of them are in food, but many of them are in other areas. Companies like Casper that's disrupting the mattress industry, or Warby Parker that's disrupting the sunglass industry, um, companies that are walking the walk. I mean, for me, not everybody has $3. And so when we think about $3, it's definitely making the democratization of access for better stuff for way more people but not everybody because there's a hunger crisis in this country and 42 million people go hungry every single day. And so when you check out at brandless.com, we, uh, we buy a meal in your honor for Feeding America um, that, can, that oversees many of the food banks in the country. And we've given away 500,000 meals thus far. So I think that when you say who's in our category, I think about Tom's, I think about Casper, I think about Warby, I think about other extraordinary companies that are going direct to consumer that are walking their walk, that are role modeling the behavior they want to see, um, and that they're doing good things um, because it's the right thing to do, not because it's a campaign, not because it's something that like works well in the media, but it's just the walk that we walk if you're going to be in a direct relationship. And so we have a lot of companies that we admire doing J that. James, you're a scientist. Who else is out there doing really cool things with food, analogous to what you're doing, but something we should all know about. And you don't, I don't need a company name, I just want to know. Sure, no, I, so I think one of the most exciting areas, I mean, people talk a lot about the human microbiome, but the egg biome is an incredibly exciting space. The you know, egg biome? Egg biome. Um, most people don't you know, really think about this, but the same way that we have microfauna all over our bodies uh, doing a lot of important tasks for us, um, plants have the, have the same thing going on. Um, great example of this, you know, in order to, to you know, produce enzymes which 
perform all the tasks inside the plant. Uh, plants need access to nitrogen uh, sources that, that they can utilize. And most plants don't have the capability to do that. And so uh, they have a symbiotic relationship uh, with uh, microorganisms that exist in what's called the rhizosphere, which is the region around the, the roots of the plant. And through these symbiotic relationships, um, those bacteria and fungi are capable of fixing nitrogen from the atmosphere, which then becomes available to the plant. So um, this area in particular, I think, is going uh, to be uh, incredibly important uh, for our, our continued development. Let me open it up to questions. I promise you a few minutes at the end. So put your hands up. You can ask health questions, awkward questions about the person next to you, whatever you wish. <laughs> and I, I, Yes, sir. And just speak loudly if you're on. There's a mic right behind you. I'm interested in the uh, comparative nutritive content of uh, soil-grown uh, vegetables versus indoor-grown hydroponic vegetables. Just share your name, sir. Uh, my name's Will Rosenzweig. So uh, a couple things there. One, if, if you could uh, flip uh, slide two up on the screen. So you guys don't work together, do you? What's that? You don't work together. No, no, no. He didn't. He didn't cue that up uh, on, on plan. So. Um, First of all, our, our system is a bit of a hybrid. We have a, uh, a media that we grow in, but we also, the plants are germinated in soil. Uh, so th they're grown there. But one of the, the, the biggest impacts uh, relative to the food that is actually consumed by a person uh, and, and the nutrients that it contains is the amount of time that it spends in trucks and distribution centers on the way to that person. Uh, and so uh, what we are finding is that the nutrient content of our food, uh, you know, that two weeks of additional shelf life is an indicator of something, and it's an indicator uh, that that food is less exhausted. So those apples that are 14 months old when you eat them, which is the average in the United States. Uh, or uh, how old? I'm sorry. 14. 14. They are gassed in nitrogen. 14 out months. In 14 months. It's hard to believe. Uh, I've, the numbers I've seen are anywhere from 11 to 14 months old. Why not two months? Why not just, you know... I wait a whole extra year. Because there's only one apple harvest a year, one northern hemisphere and one southern. And so, so they're gassing them in nitrogen. The carrots, there's only one harvest of those a year, too. Uh, those are six months old by the time you eat them most How of the time. How many of you knew that? Put your hands up. <laughs> like six people. Like well, uh, it, uh, they are roughly the same Question at the time, was, of, time of harvest. How does the energy, how does the nutrient content compare? Yeah, so we've measured them. They're roughly the same at time of harvest, but because we're collapsing, you know, a week or two off the supply chain, the nutrient content to the person is much higher. And because now you can harvest carrots all year long, holy cow, those things have actual flavor and nutrition. So. Yes, ma'am. Just share your name also. Um, hi, I'm Sasha. I'm at, with Morgan Stanley. I was wondering, what are the limits of what you can grow hydroponically? I think grains are off limits, and I'm wondering, like, apples, pomegranates, like, bananas, how far can you go? Yeah, so the question ends up being, what can we grow economically, uh, you know, that fits in people's budgets? And, uh, and today, that is related to the price of carbon fixation and the, and the cost of building sugars. And so uh, to put that into English, what that means is, uh, you know, take the fresh produce section, uh, remove tree fruit, uh, and that generally gives you an idea of what's on our roadmap over the next few years. Uh, relative to grains and other crops, medical proteins and, uh, and alternative proteins, uh, those are a few years off, but they're, we're, we're approaching them quickly. Um, but grains, not in the sense that we grow them at production scale, but rather we can do the work that others like Monsanto, Dow, DuPont, Bayer, and Syngenta have done over the years, but we can collapse that into a much shorter period of time. Uh, we have someone in the second row, then the fourth row. Hi, my name is Jamie Shen. Um, I'm really excited about APL. I think that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, how far along are you as far as like with the testing of it? Um, how is it being utilized? And then are you also um, concerned about, you know, similar to the GMO stigma, um, do you have to wash it off? Do you have, um, yeah. even though you're rearranging molecules, it's, it's in some ways very similar. Absolutely. So do we have uh, our video, Perfect Q, this is my plant? <laughs> Too good to be true. Um, so, so Couldn't produce kind of Just kind of let this play in the background. Um, you know, we've developed these formulations now for about three dozen different kinds of fresh produce. Um, as far as where we are, in uh, about three weeks, you'll be able to walk into major retailers across the United States and bring home an avocado, which will last twice as long 
uh, in your home, which is a really exciting development uh, oh, there's for, the video. Uh, for us as a business. Uh, yeah, this is an organic apple variety, uh, short shelf life. Uh, we were able to get about 30 days. Um, leafy greens, opportunities for replacement of packaging uh, in, in meal kits um, so that we don't have to ship around those big chunks of, of ice as well. Um, asparagus, uh, huge opportunity here to shift from uh, air freight of asparagus to sea freight uh, of asparagus. Again, the mechanism of spoilage is universal in, in all of these produce categories. Um, Fuertes, this is another uh, less popular genetic variety of uh, avocado because it has a short shelf life with our products, we're able to get them to approach parity with the Haas avocados. Um, here are Haas avocados. This is what you normally see on all your grocery store shelves. Um, we can get about doubling or tripling of the shelf life of a Haas avocado. Again, all without refrigeration, sitting at home on your counter. Bananas, we can add five to seven days of, of yellow time to those bananas. So we can do sequentially ripening bunches. So you'll have a banana for Monday, for Tuesday, for Wednesday, um, so, on, so on and so forth. Um, Bell peppers, we can let this go on and on, but uh, all this really is is uh, <laughs> uh, an, an illustration that the, um, what we're doing is not impacting any sort of metabolic pathway that's specific to some type of fruit or vegetable. The mechanism of produce spoilage is universal, which is this water loss and oxidation. So when you ask, do you have to wash it off? It's made from food, so we literally take molecules from inside the produce and we put them on the outside, and by precisely controlling the combinations of those materials, we're able to get these barrier properties. Um, and so uh, we're actually advertising this to the consumer. So we're actually asking you to make a conscious choice to walk into the grocery store and select a peel produce because you know it's gonna last twice as long in your home um, and have better flavor and nutritional content. Question in the fourth row here. Someone that I thought, did I see a hand up? I'm sorry. Uh, I thought I saw it. It's okay. So uh, let's go, go ahead. Hi, Kavindi Wickham again from Bain Capital. Just a quick question. So there was an uh, announcement that Bayer just bought uh, Monsanto or is in the process of doing that. What, what was sort of your reaction on reading those, that news and what do you think the implications are to the market? Was was that to me? Uh, Why just say, uh, did, did you have, oh, go ahead. Uh, so, you know, Bear Monsanto, Dow DuPont have linked up, Syngenta and ChemChina have linked up. Uh, what you see over the course of ag is you saw, you saw chemicals in the 1940s in terms of you know, fertilizers and pesticides. You saw genetics in the 1980s uh, and the rise of Monsanto and others. Uh, and uh, and w uh, what you've seen is a, uh, a flattening of the curve with respect to the, uh, the progress that we're able to make with genetics in what is an uncontrollable manufacturing environment outside. Uh, and so those, uh, a as the amount of progress and innovation has slowed, those uh, companies have found it necessary to get together. They still uh, you know, are, are doing a lot relative to yield and productivity in the world. Uh, but genetics ha have seemed to have flattened out with respect to uh, our ability to influence yield uh, in the field. Let me give you my takeaway points because we only have a minute left. Uh, you guys can add one if you want, but I learned that uh, we should move from should to want, that half of the transactions in some of these new businesses are on an app. Uh, the, the big question is who says the better has to cost more? If you take out the middleman, it may not be true. Stack them high, watch them fly, not always. Uh, that if you give uh, guaranteed returns for perishable products for people on food stamps, it impacts what they buy, which I thought was very provocative. Uh, one group of folks, the, the retailers build for shipping, not shelf. The other says the main reason for breeding is transportability. So transportation comes up in both sectors for different reasons. Uh, but you want to build to ship, not for shelf, ideally. 90% of brands are in decline. Shocking to me. Overall numbers on perishability also. 14 months for apples in terms of their shelf life in six months for carrots, no idea. Um, and I gotta say, this was a fantastic panel because we all learned a lot. I commend you all for that. Thank you all for being here. <laughs>